Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday, you made it through another week. Uh, it's been a heck of a week for a lot of people. I know um, we were just getting the Hurricane Ian up here, the re remnants of it just circled us for six days. We've been getting nothing but straight rain, cold temperatures, and uh, but uh, you know, it's a lot better than having all the winds and damage that uh, they had down in Naples and Fort Myers and things like that down in Florida. So I hope everybody's doing good down there. Um, today we have, a. it's going to be a, a short, uh, show today because we have our burner service coming tomorrow. It's a big thing for me because I, my basement's packed, cram packed, and I got to make room around the burner. I look at some of these pictures. I see pictures online of people, uh, you know, they show their basements like it's empty. I'm like, oh my God, I would fill that thing up in three weeks. It would be full. And I got to, you know, so I'm going to try and make a, a plan this winter to clear out as much as I can. But I, I have a lot of things here, fasteners and things like that I can't get rid of. Um, but my burner, I have a love affair with my 1940s Arco liner, American Standard. Man, this thing is a beast. It, it's a beast. And I know when, when oil gets expensive, it's it's a fortune to run, but... it's uh, it's It's served me well for my entire life. I've lived here my, since... Since it was put in, it has never failed us. It's just a, a terrific uh, invention. And, you know, I know I've had friends of mine going, why don't you get rid of that beast, that fuel? And the same friends that told me that have gone through three burners <laughs> in the last 20 years, you know. So a three uh, all burner and whole furnace unit. But uh, so I'm looking forward to that, you know, getting that service tomorrow. So like I said, it's been very busy for the past couple of days. We got a uh, a couple things to talk about today, so let's get right to it. Okay, first up, last episode, we uh, did these beautiful Compton U sets, and uh, what a nice pair of shears these are. Now, a couple people have had asked, what is this wire around here? Okay, now that wire, what that does is it acts as a lock washer. Now, one of the important aspects of scissors is whenever you have two pieces of metal that turn on each other, it always wants to loosen up the fastener. It's just the just the way uh, it works, you know. So what they do, a lot of fasteners are peened over. And what that means is you'll have a bolt on one side that goes through and on the other side, when you put the nut on, they will peen this over with a hammer, enlarging, mushrooming it so that this will not back off. It acts almost as a lock washer. The, you know, that is not really preferred because the scissors that are, are commercial style scissors, like these whisk scissors, they are meant to be taken apart to be serviced, to be sharpened. And they have a, a you know a lifetime of sharpenings that you can do. Uh, remember, you can't sharpen it all the way down here because uh, they have a bonded piece of hardened steel in the top here. So just because you have this much um, um, scissor material here, you know not all of this is hardened steel like the tip is. You know, it's a if you look real close, there's a a bonded piece of hardened steel, but you, you still can get a bunch of sharpenings out of these scissors before you have to, you know, before you have to buy a new pair. Now, uh, for years, they've been trying to come up with different ways because once a scissor gets loose, it's very hard. Now, anybody that uses scissors for a long time, you know, you can flex your, your thumb, pull your thumb in and push this out in order to get that to cut. You know, so if you have a loose pair of scissors, we all know how to make them tight with our hands, but you really shouldn't have to do that. So they put these uh, different kind of fasteners in here. Some have nuts, some don't. You can see this one here just gets peened over into this one here. But what you have to do is you always have to look, just take the scissor, go back and forth. Now you can see that this is stationary. So it means it's peened in over here. Now what you want to do is whenever you're going to oil uh, a scissor like this, which they do require some oil every once in a while, you put a drop around the head of the screw and also in the pivot area there and work it through. Now what happens is that'll work through the screw because remember you're winding up there and now you see it's much, much easier to operate. A lot of times, you know, it dries out in there and, and you don't want that to happen. So a good, a little drop of oil around the screw the one that doesn't move, so it seeps in, and also on the pivot point. But um, some of them are riveted, the real inexpensive ones. Now, a rivet's not bad, but you can't service this screwdriver. Like now, you know, if you're going to sharpen it, you have to sharpen it with a, you know, 
just like this. You have to open it all the way up. You can see this is a cheap Asian pair and they're riveted, you know, and you can see it's loose. It should be a little bit tighter, but it's not. Again, you can make this work by flexing your thumb and pushing your fingers out on the bottom. And uh, that's how you can get this to cut. But this is not a preferred pair. This is a cheap pair. You can always tell rivet, but any pair of a decent scissor will come with a screw. And a real good screw, you could tell a really good pair by the fastener. Some have really nice fasteners. Some have ornate brass fasteners because they're meant to be serviced. A lot of these aren't meant to be serviced. So that's what that is. That's just basically holds that, that piece of spring steel wire so it, that can't move. If that was a regular washer, you know, the washer could move from constant up and down. But this stays stationary. This locks down, has a friction fit on there. And uh, this is the side that moves. You can see that on this side, you can see how the scissor moves, but not that, not the outside. So that's where you would take your oil and you would put your drop of oil around that, that piece here, like around that stationary bolt, move it back and forth like that, and then wipe it off. And uh, that's all you have to do just to, you know, keep it lubricated. Okay, next up, you remember I bought this S-Wing professional wrecking bar. It was cheap. I got it on eBay and whatever, and it was very inexpensive. But, and again, S-Wing, uh, it's made in the USA, which I like. But what I hated about it when I got it was the thickness of that tip. And the same with this tip. It is absolutely, now you all know anybody that's ever used a wrecking bar or something, or it's meant to get in something and pry it up. What are you going to get in with that thick end? Now, I'm going to show you a vintage wrecking bar here, and this is what they should look like. You see that beautiful taper? Now, this one's still a little bit thick, but look at that taper compared, and this is a little a longer one, and look at the taper on this side, this here. You see that beautiful taper? That's what it should look like. This, I don't know what they're thinking. And it, can you imagine if this is the first wrecking bar you ever used? You know, you'd be... Oh, you would hate the tool, but when you get a good one that has a nice long taper that gets in and under anything and you could rip it up or whatever you have to do. So let's address that today. Now we're going to use the flap sander for this, but we're not going to use a flap sanding disc. We're going to use the grinding disc. You know, these discs uh, are thick. They leave a very rough surface, but then you can clean it up later with a flap disc. So let's start with this one here. Okay, we're calling this project done. Let's take a look at what we did here. You see now what we did with that tip. Isn't that just beautiful? The way that tip now, you know, is thin enough to get into something. Let's take a look at the other side. Same thing. We thinned it out. We took away that big clunk that was there. Now, you might say, now I know there's going to be people out there saying, well, it's not as strong. Absolutely. Whenever you look, it's not as any time you put any type of tip on there, it's not going to be as strong as the full size. But you got to remember something. What is this used for? It is an 18 inch crowbar. It's a small crowbar meant to get into or under something and lift it up. This is still, in my opinion, it's still a very thick tip. And uh, if you want something stronger, you get a longer crowbar. The bigger the crowbars, the thicker the diameter of the uh, inside or the shaft will be, and also the thicker the edges will be. But for a smaller crowbar, the smaller the crowbar, the thinner you want this to be, because that's the kind of work you're going to be doing with it. You're not going to try and be prying cinder blocks with an 18-inch crowbar. You know, you're going to be using a larger one. So this is a, a beautiful modification for this size. It is a perfect uh, profile for this size crowbar. And uh, there we go. Okay, next up, I have something from the show and tell time capsule from a time when quality was uh, expected. And, um, and this piece is just absolutely beautiful. I've had it for 20 something years and I think you'll find it pretty interesting, pretty rare. Let's go check it out. Wow. Okay, what you're looking at here is a probably late 50s, early 60s Kirin uh, cash box. These were popular for not only businesses, but for people that uh, had, 
they want to keep their money somewhere around the house or something and safe. And this thing was like the top of the line for, for home cash boxes or whatever. Now, as we know, that steel boxes really don't protect your money against fire. If, uh, you know, if it gets hot enough, you know, it will burn the money inside, even though you have a steel box. But it protects it against a lot of things. It's in one area. But this one has a lot of cool safeguards built in. First of all, to get into the box, you have to have either a key. See this key here? This key fits in this little keyhole here and allows you to turn this. And you have to have the combination left and right. They're different. So the combinations have to be set and you have to key the key to get into this box. That's pretty good. Now, to get into the box, every time you turn this knob to open it, an alarm will sound. So if, if you have this in your drawer and you're sleeping and somebody tries to sneak some money out or whatever, watch what happens. As soon as you turn this, this knob and... You hear that little bell? That little bell, you know, should wake you up if you're in a vicinity or whatever, but that's a little bell. That will always happen every time you, you turn that, okay? Next up, we have, uh, let's check out the inside here. How cool is this? Now, it, you can see, um, here's the instructions that came with it, you know, and uh, you have a, uh, a lift-out drawer here, okay, and that's where you would keep, I guess, some cash or things like that. And then also in here, you would have uh, three different cash drawers that you could put in, you know, different kind of uh, maybe different denominations or whatever you wanted. You could have cash. But um, here I have a couple extra keys that came with this. This key here is interesting because this key here that fits in this little slot, that's what winds up the bell. And let me show you how that's now done. Now to wind up the bell, you uh, remove you remove the uh that top tray and you just turn this until it gets tight you know and now that's wound up that's not an electronic nothing about batteries you have to worry about that alarm will last 100 years now if you look at this little button here this little button here you can see it says stop or ring now <clears throat> if you put it to the ring section that will ring whenever the door is opened or this box is moved. There's a little, uh, there's like a counterweight underneath this box that if it's moved as much as a quarter of an inch, it'll sound the alarm. How awesome is that? And then you have to use the key to get the alarm to shut off. I'll show you how that works. Okay, so now we set the, uh, the lever to ring and you can see, let's say you have this in your drawer or something like that. Let's say somebody comes in in the middle of the night and they want to take this out. You know, they're going to sneak it up very gently. You're trying to sleep, and they just lift it up a little bit. Hear ring? Now, no matter what they do, they can't shut that ringer off. They got to run. The only way to shut it off is to open this up and pull this over to stop. That's the only way to shut it off. So that's pretty interesting. No matter, even if they try and slide it or whatever, no matter how they move this box, that alarm will go off and stay, keep going off until you open up the box and reset it. So very interesting. Um, the way this was made, you know, this was made in California back in the day and, and uh, just a high quality box. I have a couple of cash boxes, but this one's my favorite because it's so well made and it's, it's indicative of like that time, that late 50s, 60s with the dual combinations and this would be great if you were a kid and you wanted to save some money or something. Huh? So in closing, short little episode today. Isn't that Kieran box pretty cool? Boy, I love when stuff was made of quality, you know? That thing's like 50, 60 years old, if not more. And it's, it's just as beautiful as the day it was made. I love stuff like that. Anyway, I hope you have a great weekend. Take care now. Bye-bye.